dwelling at the foot of a tree. You live beneath the tree, but not under any one tree, for more than three nights. After two nights, you move for fear that someone might come and make offerings to you. Cultivating ascetics don't like to have such drama affinities or a lot of food and drink, so they live under a tree, dwelling under the open sky. You don't live in a house or even under a tree, but right out in the open, meditating, dwelling in a graveyard. Living here, one is always on the alert. Look at them; they are dead. In the future, I'll be just like them. If I don't cultivate the way, what will I do when it's time to die? I'll die in all my dirt. Dwelling in a graveyard is a good cure for laziness, ribs not touching the mud. This means always sitting and never lying down, cultivating rigorously and not fearing suffering. These are the five ascetic practices which deal with dwelling. Mahakasyapa cultivated not only one ascetic practice, but all twelve of them very thoroughly. Once the Buddha moved over and asked him to sit beside him, the Buddha couldn't bear to see him cultivating ascetic practices at his age. Kasyapa, he said, "You are over two hundred years old, too old for ascetic practices. Take it easy; you can't endure them." The venerable Kasyapa smiled. He didn't say whether or not he would obey the Buddha's instructions, but he returned and continued to practice it just as before. The Buddha knew this and was extremely pleased, because within my drama, Mahakasyapa cultivates ascetic practices. He said, "The Buddha will remain long in the world. He is a great ascetic, foremost in ascetic season." The twelve ascetic practices are cultivated by those who have left the home life. I haven't left the home life. Someone says, "Why are you explaining them to me?" This seems like a good question, but if you look into it, it's really irrelevant. Why? Perhaps you have not left home in this life. But how do you know that you did not leave home in the a past life, and cultivate these practices? Perhaps you have just forgotten, and so I am reminding you. Even if you did not leave home in past lives, perhaps next life the opportunity will arise, and the body seeds planted in this life will mature. Then your merit and virtue will be perfected, and you will feel very comfortable practicing asceticism, because you heard about it in this life. Next life, you will enjoy cultivating it. Perhaps in the past, you planted good causes, and now you reap the good fruit. Or perhaps in this life, you plant good causes, and in a future life, we reap the good fruit. No one can say that someone will always leave home, or that someone else will always be at home, or that someone will always be a common person. Common people all have the opportunity to realize Buddhahood. In the future, these twelve ascetic practices will be of great use. Mahakatiyana. Maha has been explained. Katiyana means literary elegance. Because of all the Buddha disciples, this venerable one was the foremost in debate. No one could defeat him. On one occasion, a non-Buddhist who believed in annihilationism said, "Buddhists speak of the revolving wheel of the six paths of rebirth and maintain that after death one may be reborn again as a person. But this principle is incorrect. Why? If people can come back as people, why hasn't anyone ever died and then returned home, or sent a letter to his family?" There's no basis for such a view. When people die, they go out like a lamb, and they can't be born again. Buddhists imagine that there's rebirth, but actually there's none.
There is none. Maha Katyayana replied, You asked why those who die do not return. Before I answer first, let me ask you a question. If someone were put in jail for a crime, could he return home at his convenience? No, said the non-Buddhist. Of course not. Katyayana continued. When people descend to, to rebirth in their house, it's just the same and they can't return. In fact, they are even less free to leave. The non-Buddhist said, Granted that those born in their house cannot return. Still, those born in their heavens are very free. Why has none of them ever sent a letter home informing his family of his whereabouts? Katyayana said, what you say has principle, but by way of analogy, suppose someone slipped and fell into a toilet, not a flush toilet, toilet, obviously. No one could fall into a flush toilet, but into a pit toilet, about as big as a bedroom. Once he got out, would he decide he lacked the aroma there and jump back in again? Heavens no, exclaimed the non-Buddhist. The world of men, said Katyayana, is just like a toilet, and birth in their heavens is like getting out. That's why no one comes back. Even if they did, there's a time difference to consider. For example, one day and night in their heaven of the 33 is equal to 100 years in the world of men. Born there, it would take a couple of days to find a place to stay and get settled. And by the time one returned on the third day, one's friends would have long been dead. Thus, Mahakatya Yanasyabal defeated non-Buddhists who were attached to the idea of annihilationism, um, annihilation or permanence. They lost every time. Katya Yana's name also means found court. Soon after he was born, his father died and his mother wanted to remarry. But the child was a tie like a fan cord, which prevented her from doing so. He is also called Good Shoulders because his shoulders were beautiful and a victorious thinker because his eloquence was unobstructed. There are four kinds of unobstructed eloquence. With an obstructed eloquence in drama, one can explain the drama without obstacle. With an obstructed eloquence in meaning, one can explain the drama's limitless meanings. With an obstructed eloquence in phrasing, one's rhetoric is effective. With the eloquence of an obstructed delight in speech, one takes delight in explaining the drama. Because he had these four kinds of unobstructed eloquence, Mahakatyayana was the foremost of the Buddha's disciples in debate. Mahakausthila Mahakausthila was Shariputra's maternal uncle. His name means Big Knees because Big Knees ran in the family. He too was gifted in debate in order to defeat his nephew. He went to southern India to study non-Buddhist debating theories, rushing through his meals and gulping down water, studying so hard that he didn't even take time to wash his face or cut his nails. His nails grew so long, in fact, that he was nicknamed the long-nailed Brahmin. Revata. Revata means constellation. He was named after the fourth of the 28 constellations, the house, the rabbit, and the sun, because his parents prayed to this constellation in order to have their son. Revata also means false unity. One day he went walking. When it got dark, he was far from home and decided to spend the night in a shack beside the road. Just as he was about to fall asleep, two ghosts walked in, a big ghost and a small ghost. The big ghost was really big with 
a green face, red hair, and huge mouth with six teeth hanging like eleven tusks from it. One to look at him would have scared you to death. The little ghost was even uglier. His eyes, ears, nose, and mouth had all moved to the middle of his face. The two came in dragging a corpse, and asked Rafata, "What do you think? Should we eat this corpse or not?" What they meant was, "If you tell us to eat the corpse, we'll eat you instead. If you tell us not to eat the corpse, we won't have anything to eat, and so we'll have to eat you." The ghosts were going to eat him no matter what he said. Rafata didn't say a word. The big ghost bit off the corpse's legs, and the little ghost ripped off Rafata's legs and stuck them on the corpse. Then the ghost ate the corpse's arms, and the little ghost ripped off Rafata's arms and stuck them on the corpse. The big ghost ate the entire corpse, and the little ghost replaced its parts one by one with parts of Rafata's body. Rafata then thought. My body has been used to repair the corpse, and so now I don't have a body. The next day, he ran screaming down the road, asking everyone he met, "Hey, take a look! Do I have a body?" What they said, the townspeople had no idea what he was talking about, but he kept pestering them until finally no one could come near him. He's nuts, they said. Finally, Rivata met. Met two high masters, Shramanas. He asked, "Do I have a body?" The two high masters happened to be on the hot, seeing that Rivata's potential for enlightenment was nearly mature, and that he would soon certify to the Dharma body. They instructed them. They instructed him, saying, "The body is basically created." By a combination of causes and conditions, when the causes and conditions separate, the body is destroyed. There is nothing that is you, and nothing that is not you. Just as they said this, Ah, Rivata was enlightened. He left home and certified to the fruit, and thus his name means false unity of the Buddha's disciples. He is foremost in being not upset or confused. Sudipanthaka, Sudipanthaka, and Mahapanthaka were brothers. Sudipanthaka's name means little roadside, and his big brother's name means big roadside. In India, it is the custom for women who are about to give birth to return to their parents' home. But Mahapanthaka's mother didn't want to go home, and so she waited until the last minute to leave. Consequently, her son was born on the side of the road. When the time came to give birth to her second child, she should have known better. But again, she waited. It happened again. The second child was called Little Roadside. Also born in similar circumstances. The two brothers were very different in nature. The older brother was remarkably intelligent, but the younger was one was remarkably stupid. He was so stupid that he couldn't even remember half a line of verse. The Buddha had instructed five hundred arhats to teach him a verse, and they took turns day and night trying to teach him. Guard your mouth, unite your mind. With your body, don't offend. Do not annoy a single living being. Stay far away from non-beneficial bitter practices. Conduct like this can surely save the world. The three commas of body, mouth, and mind should be pure. Do not cause others to be afflicted, and don't cultivate ascetic practices which are not in accord with dharma. These non-beneficial bitter practices include maintaining. The morality of dogs or cows, worshiping fire, sleeping in ashes, and sleeping or sitting on beds of nails, which of course hurts a lot. One who cultivates virtue and at the same time avoids these meaningless practices can truly save the world. For many days, 
in 500 hours combat their great spiritual powers, trying to teach little Rothside the, the verse. They taught him over and over, over and over, and he forgot it. Recite the verse, they would say, but I can't remember it, little Rothside would answer. Finally, his brother scolded him. You were good for nothing, he shouted. You can't leave home. You are useless, and he chased him away. Little Rothside may not have had much of a memory, but he certainly had a temper. If you won't let me leave home, he shouted, I'll show you, I'll kill myself. He grabbed a rope, ran to the backyard, and climbed a tree, ready to hang himself. At that moment, Shakyamuni Buddha transformed himself into a tree spirit and explained the drama to him. Your brother is your brother, he said, and you are you. He says, you can't leave home, but you don't have to listen. You can cultivate right here. Why should you kill yourself? That makes sense, sniffed Little Roadside. He's he and I'm me. He has no right to tell me I can't leave home. Right, said Shakyamuni Buddha. Since you can't remember half a line, I'll give you two words, sweep clean. Remember these two words and use them to sweep your heart clean. Sweep the floor and sweep your heart free from dust. Little Roadside said, yes, I'll sweep my heart. Sweep what? Clean, said the Buddha, sweep clean. Oh yes, said Little Roadside. Clean. What was the first word again? Sweep, smiled the Buddha. Sweep clean, said Little Roadside, and he recited and swept, remembering the Buddha's instruction to sweep his heart clean. In less than a week, all of a sudden he was enlightened, understood everything very clearly, penetrated the real mark of all dramas, and was even more intelligent than his brother. Little roadside wasn't like us. We recite Namo Amitabha Buddha every day, but the more we recite, the more false thinking we have. If stupid people work hard and cultivate, they also can become enlightened. Don't say, I'm too stupid to understand the sutras. Do you, if you don't understand them, don't read them. It will suffice to contemplate your heart for when you have seen it clearly, you will be enlightened. How should you contemplate your own heart, watch for false thinking, and sweep it out of your heart? Then you can be enlightened. Little Roadside, stupid as he was, became enlightened. We are all much more intelligent than he, and could no doubt remember sweep clean hearing it only once. So don't treat yourself or take yourself lightly. Go forward bravely and study the Buddha drama. Were I to speak the most wonderful drama, unless you believed it, it would be of no use to you. But were I to speak utter nonsense, should you actually practice, it would be wonderful drama. If you don't practice the wonderful drama, it is not wonderful for you. You must always make vigorous progress. Don't fall behind or get lazy. This is most important, for if you can always make progress, the day will certainly come when you recognize your original face. Nanda There were three disciples with the name Nanda, Ananda, Sudharana, Sudharananda, and Nanda. Nanda, whose name means wholesome bliss, was a cowherd before he heard the Buddha speak and decided to leave the home life. He is to be distinguished from Ananda, the Buddha's first cousin, and Sudarananda, the Buddha's little brother. Before leaving the home life, Nanda was a cowherd. When he listened to the Buddha's preach, the eleven matters of tending cows Using the tending of cows as an analogy for cultivation of the way, Nanda knew that the Buddha was possessed of all knowledge and he resolved to leave home and soon attained the fruit of a hardship. On one occasion, the Buddha instructed Nanda to preach 
to a group of 500 Bishunis. Hearing him speak, they all attained a hardship. In the past, the 500 Bishunis had been the concubines of a king. The king was a great Dharma protector, but he, and he built a large pagoda in honor of a Buddha. The concubines believed in the Buddha and made daily offerings at the pagoda, vowing that they would, in the future, all obtain liberation with the king. The king was a former incarnation of Nanda, Sudarananda. Sudarananda was the Buddha's little brother. He loved his wife, Sundari, more than anything. The two of them were as if glued together. Walking, standing, sitting, and lying down, they were never apart. One day, as the Buddha returned from the palace where he had gone to collect alms, he passed Sundari, Sundari and Nanda, who were having lunch. When he saw the Buddha, he went out to fill his bowl. As he left, Sundari spit on the floor and said, You may give the Buddha food, but if you don't return before that twice, you are in trouble. Okay, said Sudara Nanda, and off he went. What do you think the Buddha did? Every time Sundara Nanda took a step forward to hand the Buddha his bow, the Buddha moved away with his spiritual powers so that in what seemed like just a few steps, Sundara Nanda suddenly found himself in a jetta grove five miles from home. As soon as they arrived, the Buddha shaved Sudarananda's head. Sudarananda had no desire to leave home life because he did not want to give up his wife. But the Buddha was his older brother, and so he compli complied. You can cut off my hair, he thought, but the first chance I get, I'm going to run away.